a call to order. Um, the time currently is 1.35 on uh, April 10th. Um, I want to remind everyone to please turn off your cell phones to limit any background noise um, if needed. Um, and you know, keep yourself order. muted if you um, can. The time currently um, is one. I'm going to do a quick introduction of myself real fast. My name is Whitney Hill, I'm chair. Um, she, her, hers. I'm a black woman um, with curly brown hair, wearing a kind of red pashmina, but black, a uh, white background behind me. Um, to kind of kick off this meeting, I um, want to observe and actually have a moment of silence for uh, Judy Human, who uh, recently passed. On the screen, we have a black and white photo of Judy who's wearing glasses and a floral blouse um, in her wheelchair with a blurred background. Underneath her pictures, it says in loving memory of Judy Human, December 18th, 1947, March 4th, 2023. Uh, Judy Human, uh, widely regarded as the mother of the ADA, uh, passed away in uh, Washington, D.C., March 4th. 2023. Judy was at the forefront of major disability rights demonstrations, helped spearhead the passage of disability rights legislation, and founded a number of national and international disability advocacy organizations. The work we do here through the CTA's ADA advis advisory committee is directly connected to the legacy of those like Judy, who fought hard to ensure that people with disabilities have a seat at the table and are a part of the conversation of equitable change. Let us take a moment of silence and remember Judy by taking to heart her quote, for we are leaders of inclusiveness and community of love, equity, Injustice. I want to thank everybody in participating um, and honoring Judy's life and for the moment of silence. And I would like to now move forward with uh, with roll call. So let's see, starting off with the roll call, um, I'd like to briefly announce um, the three new members um, who are present here today um, at our meeting. Um, and I wanna start off and, and let them introduce themselves first. Um, so let's see, I'm just gonna go down um, this list here and we're gonna start off with uh, Cynthia. Notification from Outlook. Okay, I think Cynthia, she might not be with us at the moment. Um, we're just going to move down the list. Uh, we're going to go to Sarah. And um, when you introduce yourself, can you please uh, introduce your pronouns and then brief description um, of what you're wearing? Hello. Hi, Sarah. Hello, this is Sarah. Um, what, I'm sorry, what did you want me to include in my introduction? Um, if you can just uh, include um, your pronouns and then a brief um, a description of yourself. Oh, of course. Uh, so my pronouns are she, her, hers, and I am a um, African-American, Mexican-American woman with uh, brown curly hair, and I frequently wear glasses. Thank you so much, Luna. Or I'm sorry, I should find your last name. Thank you so much, Sarah. Um, uh, next um, on the list, we have Laura. Hi. Um, I'm Laura Saltzman, um, Excess Living. I'm a, oh, she, her, uh, I'm a white woman with uh, brown hair, usually thrown up in a ponytail with a, with a black top on today. Thank you so much, Laura. Uh, next, we have Barbara. Hi, everyone. I'm uh, Barbara Padilla. My pronouns are uh, she, her, and I'm wearing, I'm a white woman and uh, with sort of blondish hair. I wear, wear glasses, and I've got a, a green shirt and a green sweater on. Thank you, Barbara. 
Next, we have Mary. Audio now unmuted. Mute, currently unmuted. Hold play button. Am I unmuted now? Yes, we can hear you. Oh, okay, good. I'm uh, Mary Abramson. I'm a uh, pronoun is she, her. I'm a white woman with uh, short brown hair, and um, I'm here representing the visually impaired community. Thank you so much, Mary. And next we have Doreen. Hi, uh, Doreen Bogus. Um, I'm, all, I'm here representing MOPD. Pronouns are she, her. Um, I am sitting in my office well, at the field office I'm in a cubicle chair, um, and I have lighted, light color, kind of multicolored hair, like blondish, brownish, grayish, whitish, <laughs> and then I'm wearing a maroon sweater. Thank you so much, Doreen. Um, next on the list is myself. Um, as I've um, already formally introduced myself, um, I am present. Uh, next on the list, we have Robin. Hi, this is Robin Jones, and I am uh, used to her as my pronouns, and I'm the director of the Great Lakes ADA Center located at the University of Illinois at Chicago. Thank you so much, Robin. And next we have Michael. Hey, this is Michael Kaiser, and I am uh, an old white guy who uh, has uh, salt and pepper hair. Uh, he, him are my pronouns. Thank you so much, Michael. And then last but not least, we have Nicholas. And, oh, there we go. My name is Nicholas Robertson. I have a bald shaved head, dark brown eyes, light brown goatee, and I'm wearing a gray dress shirt today. My pronouns are he, him, his. And I'm representing the blind and low vision community of the Chicago land area. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Nicholas. Uh, next, we're going to move on to the, our CTA facilitators. Uh, first, we have Irma. Hey everyone, I am Irma Gomez. I am Mexican American. I use a powered wheelchair. Um, I use she, her pronouns. I'm currently wearing a orange brownish uh, sweater. Um, I have brown hair and brown eyes, and I'm currently at the CTA headquarters. Thank you so much, Irma. Uh, next we have Michael. Uh, good afternoon. I'm, I'm Michael Conley. I'm the CTA's chief planning officer. Um, and uh, my pronouns are um, he, him, his. Uh, I'm wearing a, a, a blue and white check shirt with a green uh, tie. Thank you so much, Michael. And then uh, we have the wonderful Miss Elsa. Hello, um, I'm Elsa Gutierrez. I'm the VP of Scheduling and uh, Service Planning. Um, I'm in the office uh, with a blurred screen. I have brown hair, glasses, um, and wearing a blue dress with a necklace, and I identify as a she, uh, her. Thank you so much, Elsa. And so it looks like we had only one absence. Is that correct? That was Cynthia. Um, and it looks like we have a seven-person uh, quorum. Um, we can now move on to our minutes. Um, actually, before we do that, I want to um, open up um, to announcements and ask if there's any member who has um, any significant um, event on the horizon, such as an upcoming disability-related uh, live or virtual event that they would like to, to share with us now. Uh, this um, is I have Robin. a quick question. Oh, oh, sorry. I was just going to ask a question. It's Doreen from MOPD. Um, you said Cynthia is a new member um, who is not here. Can can you just um, give a brief intro introduction since she's a new member? Yeah, would, Irma, would you like to do the introduction? Uh, Cynthia has been present in the past and made their own introduction. Um, and they did let me know that they will be absent today. Um, do we still... Um, yeah, so she, she was here since the October meeting, Doreen. Uh, 
Um, and then I saw that, um, I think Robin, um, I think you had unmuted as well. Did you want to share an announcement? I was just going to share a couple of um, upcoming sessions that we have at the Great Lakes ADA Center that might be of interest to, to people. Um, we have uh, a couple of sessions this uh, next week. Um, and this week we have a, an Ask the ADA Professional, which is kind of an open Q&A program that is going to be focused on healthcare um, and issues of the ADA and healthcare. If people are interested, you can just come and ask your any question. It's not got a specific um, agenda. It's, it's basically open, open Q&A for people to just come on if they have questions about their own issues and access, you know, for healthcare, et cetera, under the ADA. And then we have, um, that's on Wednesday. Um, and then on Thursday, we have a session on uh, accessible uh, temporary events. So things that, you know, um, fairs and, you know, uh, farmers markets and all those kinds of things um, that will be focused on accessibility of those events and the requirements for that. So if you're interested, you can just go to our website at www.accessibilityonline.org and sign up. They're all free. So. Thank you so much, Robin, for, for sharing that with us. Um, those sound like amazing presentations. Um, is there anyone else who has an announcement that they would like to share? Okay, there's no more announcements. We're going to move on to the approval of January 9th, 2023 uh, meeting minutes. Um, so I do want to note that everyone did receive the minutes prior to the meeting for review. Um, and I'm going to open it up and ask now if anyone has any changes to the minutes um, that they would like to, to discuss now. Okay, if there are no um, changes or corrections, I'm going to ask for a motion to approve the January 9th, 2023 meeting minutes. Um, does somebody, um, do I have someone who moves to pass? I move that we approve the January minutes. Thank you so much, Michael. Um, do we have a second? And I'll second it. Thank you so much, Barbara. Um, okay, so it looks like the meeting minutes are approved and we can move forward with our public comments. Um, I'm going to pass it over to Irma. Um, did we receive any public comments? Yes, uh, we received two public comments. Um, and uh, I'll go ahead and read the first one um, from Gar Garland Armstrong. Uh, his public comment was, uh, when there's no traffic light, um, if the CTA bus operators are able to help um, people who are blind or visually impaired um, when no one else can, um, and what is the training um, to assist visual impaired uh, riders when they are getting off of the uh, bus. So thank you, Garland, uh, for your comment. And the second one is from Anne Sullivan uh, from Edgewater. Uh, and their comment is as follows. Um, as a disabled CTA uh, writer, I must complain on the lack of uh, on the lack of training of drivers on the right of uh, disabled passengers. I take my grandchildren on the bus every morning and I use, use it exclusively to get around. I understand that a walker is an inconvenience to all uh, involved, including myself, but drivers pay no attention even with people uh, without walkers uh, who have no uh, uh, who have no way or reasoning or skills um, to move around. Um, for people who use walkers, I have seen the driver open the doors on a wheelchair with three uh, walkers already biting for space, uh, letting the passengers uh, pull through um, or have to wear out of the uh, waiting area for elderly to sit down. Um, they never want to open the door um, when there is someone who is abstaining from the way um, of the door, and there's already three walkers um, in the way. Um, the priority seating uh, for people who can't ride, uh, we want to make sure that more often 
drivers are not yelling um, at individuals with walkers um, since they can't uh, move out of the aisle when there are teenagers um, that are taking up the priority seating. Uh, there's more uh, issues when the drivers are also not well trained, um, who have who have had uh, they they have had three drivers tell them that they cannot put up the seat um, for uh, to make uh, space for the walker, um, and the walker um, need to take up cannot be cannot take up space on the aisle. Um, and they've had uh, drivers tell them um, that the walker is not disabled um, and that they should not uh, be taking up the space of the priority seating. Um, so they feel um, that it is entirely um, the driver's fault um, for not having the proper training, but they also feel they understand that they are also really good drivers that are assisting uh, people with disabilities and walkers that come into the uh, buses. Um, the CTA is not uh, training the drivers um, and the complaints go unheard. Um, even with photos, even with cameras on the bus, it's like they just don't care, um, prove me wrong. Thank you so much, Irma, for uh, reading the public comments that were submitted. Um, and if there's no more public comments, um, we are going to move forward with our agenda. Um, uh, excuse me. I'm sorry. This is Doreen from MLPD. I was wondering, can we get response to those public comments? Yeah. So we discussed that in the uh, CTA uh, section. Um, we will be discussing the public comments or what comes after the public comments. Okay, so you'll be addressing them later in the meeting? Yeah, um, I'll be addressing them um, in the following meeting. So today I'll be, I will be addressing the comment that was posed in January. And then in the following meeting, I will be addressing the comments that are posed today. Okay, thanks. Thank you, Doreen, for your question. Um, if there's no more questions or comments, we're going to move on to um, the next list um, item on our agenda. Um, we're moving over to our presentations now, and up we have um, the All Stations Accessible Program ASAP update presented by Steve Mashiri, Vice President of Capital Construction. Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Stephen Mascheri. My pronouns are he, him. I am a male, early 40s, uh, slight beard, uh, dark brown hair, what's left of it. And uh, I'm sitting at my home with a blurred background. Um, Irma, did you want me to put up the presentation or did you... Um, who do you want to have put up the presentation to share? I don't know if I have the ability to share a screen. Yes, you have the ability to share. Okay, one moment, please. All right. Um, the ASAP program for CTA is well underway. Um, phase one, as we discussed last uh, last meeting, is uh, fully funded, um, and we are also moving well into phase two um, with the Forest Branch uh, Reconstruction Program, where we have uh, the Racine Station funded and ready to go out to bid. We also have recently received funding, as we talked about last meeting, for Irving Park and the Belmont stations.
for the phase one overview, uh, the Racine station, uh, this project was approved at the February 2023 board. We are currently waiting for concurrence. We expect the project to begin uh, later this year with the construction project going through the end of 2025. Austin Green Line Station uh, and Lake Street is currently out to bid. We're expecting those bids to come in in early May with construction to begin Q3 of 2023 and completed at the end of 2024. California Milwaukee Blue Line Station is currently, uh, we're about to receive the 60% design milestone. We expect the construction to begin 2024 and be done middle of 2025. Montrose Blue Line Station, we are just about to kick off the design for that station, Montrose on the Kennedy Blue Line. We don't expect that construction work to start until Q1 of 2025 and go through Q2 of 2026. Uh, the last station is the, is we're doing in conjunction with State and Lake, um, which is currently being prepared for uh, procurement with uh, the city of Chicago. Um, we're expecting that work to begin sometime in 2024. And in coordination, there's work happening with the RPM stations with Lawrence, Argyle, Berwyn, and Bryn Mawr, which I think uh, um, will be covered separately. A uh, couple of renderings for stations that are ready for construction. Um, for the Racine station is fully, uh, is the top slide, um, is a rendering of the exterior of the station looking south. Um, which would be a fully ADA compliant entrance with a new elevator at Racine Station. Um, and we'll be going, be starting that work, as I said, later this year. The slide at the bottom is a rendering of the Lake Green Austin Station. Um, bids are due May of 23, and the work beginning, beginning later next year, this year. Here's another rendering uh, looking from expressway level, which will be looking northeast at the Racine Station um, entrance. So you can see the st stairwell coming from the bridge level down to track level. And then the top of the building is the top of the elevator tower. Uh, lastly is the station uh, footprint. Uh, I believe this was a, a question that came up um, last, uh, last month's or last quarter's meeting, sorry. Uh, about a straight path from the station entrance to the elevator. Um, as you can see here, as denoted in the, with the red line, there is a straight path to go from the station entrance through the, um, the ADA compliance uh, swing gate into the passenger elevator. So it's a nice, smooth uh, access path. Uh, projects on the, on the horizon um, are two renderings. The top one is uh, the State and Lake project, which will be, uh, we're doing some initial uh, utility work right now, but that will, this is a rendering looking north um, on State Street at the intersection of State and Lake, um, which will be managed by CDOT with close coordination by CTA uh, for uh, input and coordination. The bottom slide uh, rendering is the Montreux station, a rendering where you can see there will be an entrance uh, both on the north and south portions of the bridge um, at project time of project completion. ASAP phase two, um, as we talked about last month, we re recently received the $118 million FTA grant, uh, which would include the Irving Park, Belmont, and uh, Pulaski stations, which we're really excited about. Um, and then next, we also have uh, formula funds for design of two stations, which is Lake on the Green, uh, Park on the Green Line and Ridgeland on the Green Line. Uh, thank you for your time. If you have any questions, I'm ready to take them now. Thank you so much, Steve. Um, yes, if anyone has any questions. Yes, Barbara, I see your hand. Yeah, I was I was just wondering how the um, construction on those blue on the blue line stations um, are they coordinated uh, 
to happen like after the Kennedy construction or are they going to, you know, be out of commission at the same time the Kennedy's under? I was just curious about the staging of that, given the, the big highway project. That's that's a really good question, Barbara. Um, so the Racine station is on the Eisenhower. So we we meet on a regular basis with the IDOT officials to coordinate lane closures. Um, we feel we're far enough away that we should be able to have both projects happening um, at the same time, um, as well as the California station, that's California, Milwaukee. So we're kind of off the Kennedy there. Um, as we're getting into the design for the Montreux station, we'll be discussing with, with the IDOT officials on what makes sense uh, and when that project should be let. Because obviously that's kind of right where those uh, those dual lane closures start and kind of all the work, the uh, the traffic really starts to back up. So that's something we're trying to take into account um, with kind of that mega project going on right now. Thank you. Sure. Thank you. Thank you, Barbara, for your question. Um, is there any other questions for Steve? Yes, this is Doreen from MOPD. Um, this might... Um, be more of a question for CTA, but I wanted to know um, after the um, all stations accessibility project is complete, what percentage or how many of the train stations will be fully accessible? Um, I, the intent of the ASAP program is uh, to get every station complete at the end of the program during. Um, so the projects that I've listed right now, um, I don't have the percentage off the top of my head, but I can find it for you. So Steve, okay, do you know, uh, do you know how many? Oh, well, first of all, how many stations are there total in all? Like one hundred and fifty or something like that. There's one hundred and forty-five. Okay, of those one hundred and forty-five, how many are currently um, fully accessible? One hundred and three. One hundred and three. Okay, and then do we have any? Um, like targets for okay the end of 2023 the end of 2024 end of 2020 because I, I it sounds like the last one is the end of 2026 right yeah i mean they're going to be completed over the next couple years but after um both the phase one and then the phase two that steve presented um the system will be at 81 percent accessible and that'll be at the end of 2026 yeah it'll it'll that's like yeah at, at the end date but you'll get gradual changes from the 70 percent up to the 80 percent over the next two years right right because some some will be completed before others okay and That's then correct. um and then at the end of 2026 is i'm sorry is at the end of phase one or phase two um there's partial of phase one and then phase two will kind of overlap um toward you know, sometime in 25, 26 through 27 with the ah, okay. Belmont and Pulaski. Mm -hmm. but, there, but there's other stations beyond that um, in phase three and four, you know, that CTA will keep trying to look for funding for that. So our goal is to continue to strive past that 81% um, from now till we're 100% accessible. Right. But initially, the, in the foreseeable future, um, what can be projected out is 81%. That's the first, um, you know, that's that's basically, you know, what's in, in process now. That's correct. And it totals to 14 stations. So it's 14. So, oh, 14, 14 additional stations? Yep. Oh, on top of the 103. Oh, yeah, correct. Got and it. That Thank you. 81%. Yep, you're welcome. Thank you. Thank you, Doreen, for your question, and thank you, Aaron, for, for um, helping us answer that. Um, and before we move on to the next uh, presentation, I just want to make sure, um, are there any other questions um, that would like to be asked at the moment um, about the ASAP program? Oh, hey, Barbara. I, I forgot to mention, mention that. Um, I think that the the rendering of the state and lake station looks really cool, especially being a downtown station, um, kind of a gateway into the loop. Um, I know there's probably further development that that project, I'm really looking forward to 
uh, that station being accessible. It's uh, got quite narrow platforms right now and it's a little scary to you. So personally, I am really looking forward to that. And I think it looks really cool what, what that rendering shows. Thank you. So agreed. Um, thank you so much, Steve, for, for talking to us today, um, for updating us about the ASAP program. Um, thank you so much, and I hope you have a, a good afternoon. Um, and now we're going to move on to the red-purple modernization RPM updates, which is going to be presented by Jeff Wilson, Director of Community Relations of RPM. Hey, Whitney. Can you hear me okay? Yes, you sound great. Great, good to see everyone. Uh, my name is Jeff Wilson. As what you said, I'm the Director of Government Community Relations for the Red Purple Modernization Program. Uh, I am a very early 50s white male with a fancy RPM vest on. Uh, I wear glasses and I just got a fresh haircut, so it looks really good on this camera. Um, and I am calling in from the Red Purple Modernization Project Office, which is at 5137 North Broadway, and I encourage everybody to come visit me, as I am here by myself, um, and I would love visitors. Um, so this is going to be a brief update because nothing really exciting has changed since I last met with you at the last uh, meeting. Uh, we are still transitioning and putting together our community outreach program for the stage B process of the Red Purple Modernization Project, specifically in the LBMM, which is the Lawrence to Bryn Mawr Modernization Area. So that includes the modernization and rebuild of the four stations, starting with Lawrence, going north to Argyle. Berwyn and Bryn Mawr, and we will have full construction by the end of 2025 and hopefully ribbon cutting at the beginning of 2026. Um, so the stage B process really is the construction of those four new stations. Um, we continue to work on that north mainline section in the red purple bypass area, which is between Belmont and Addison. And in that area, as I've explained before, we are straightening out the tracks, putting in new systems signal systems, which is really exciting, and a lot of uh, not very sexy work, to be honest with you. All the sexy work is going to start happening on the north side with the uh, build of the new stations. Um, we are going to have the temporary stations. Of, so right now in the stage B, we have to move those temporary stations at uh, Argyle and Red Barn. So that is in the process. We expect that to be completed by June. Um, and the, like I said earlier, the, the, the permanent station completion would be late 2025, early 2026. Um, as always, I would love to give a tour of the project area. Uh, we did do a tour back in, uh, March with some people and I, uh, really appreciate everyone for joining me on that. It's fun. We had a bit of a nice weather, but, uh, as always, there's an open invitation for anybody to come and do a full tour of the entire red purple modernization project area. Does anybody have any questions? And Whitney, thank you so much. And, and Irma, thank you so much for giving me the opportunity to give these updates. I appreciate it. Thank you so much for, for coming out and for sharing the updates with us. Um, yeah, are, are there any questions for, for Jeff about the RPM? Okay, it looks like there's uh, no questions at the moment. Um, so we're going to move on to the next topic. Thank you again, Jeff, for um, Thank you, everyone. For talking to us. Thank you. Um, next on our agenda, we have safety updates uh, presented by Kevin Ryan, Vice President of Security. Good afternoon. Can you guys hear me? Yes. Okay, um, my name is Kevin Ryan. I'm the Vice President of Security for the CTA. And I'm gonna give you a quick overview of where we're at right now um, with the police department and our private security strategies uh, moving forward. Um, right now, uh, the basically on the police end of things, the police department beefed up uh, their presence missions 
and activity on the CTA probably around the end of uh, August. Since then, we have seen a steady drop in CTA related crime, um, index crimes, which are serious crimes and violent crimes. Uh, the police department um, is uh, the primary law enforcement uh, provider for the CTA is the Chicago Police Department's public uh, transportation section. Um, they deploy out on the CTA every day, 24 seven. In addition to that, the CTA supply or pays for officers from the Chicago Police Department working their days off to uh, work the system um, and around the clock every day. And we recently increased the pay for the officers to make it uh, comparable to the city sponsored overtime. So in doing so, we went from 20 to 25 officers a day, we're, we're up around 48 officers a day. So that's, that's proven successful. Um, you may see uh, over the next few weeks or something, overall crime on the CTA is up like 30%. Uh, technically that is true, but that 30%, I believe, uh, if my math was correct, about 29% of that increase was officer-initiated um, activity, meaning an officer saw somebody flipping a turnstile, an officer saw somebody selling drugs, an officer saw somebody or grabbed somebody with a weapon. So those are things that would have gone unreported, but the officer caught them, arrested them, and took them off the system. So um, that's while we don't like crime ever, uh, that's that's kind of a good good indicator that the officers are engaged, paying attention, and addressing the issues on the CTA. Um, private security wise, we have uh, three or four, actually three main companies that are public facing, um, and a couple of subcontractors that are. Uh, minority businesses or disadvantaged businesses. Um, our three, uh, our mains are Action Canine, uh, Intercon Security, and Monterey Security. Monterey Security covers primarily the south side and the red line. Intercon covers primarily the blue line and the north side. Um, Action K-9 is uh, obviously the K-9 patrols, and they cover primarily st uh, stationary assignments throughout the system. Um, currently, we put out in excess of 300 security officers per day. Uh, that's 24-7. We are also now starting to staff uh, stations that are unstaffed by CTA personnel during the overnight hours. And as we move forward, we're moving, we're um, going to be staffing all of our stations, um, hopefully on or near Memorial Day weekend during the overnight hours. Um, that is dependent on manpower avail availability. Um, as in other industries, the security industry is challenged with getting uh, new employees, and uh, but our companies are moving forward. And uh, as of right now, it looks like we're we're making progress and getting those uh, personnel out in place uh, by Memorial Day weekend. But um, getting back, uh, the public transportation. Uh, one other thing, the chief of patrol, the Chicago Police Department, has also issued orders to every district in the city. So that's every each of the 22nd, 22 police districts in the city have been instructed to make uh, CTA checks multiple times on each shift each day. That includes buses and rail and stations. So uh, combined all together, that's um, increased the amount of security checks done by the police department um, over last year, the same time frame, January to April, uh, 
by a, over 30,000. Um, I think last year there was 19, 19,000 some change uh, checks. This year we're, we're close to 50,000 checks. Um, those are where you see the officers show up. They conduct uh, drills. Uh, some of them ride trains. They, they walk the platforms, check buses, et cetera, et cetera. And that, that's continuing uh, now. Um, that's pretty much it in a nutshell. Um, as I said, um, right now, violent crime and major index crimes are continuing to be down. The public transportation section is really doing a great job. Um, they're also doing a lot of outreach, community outreach, and working with our contractors to address uh, homeless people on the system. Um, so they're they're pitching in there as well, and uh, I'd be happy to answer any questions. Audio valid muted. Muted. Currently unmuted. Hold plus A button. Mute. This is Mary. I would like to know if there's any thought to hiring some mental health professionals to monitor some of the trains, especially in some of the troubled areas, or even the buses, so that. Um, you know, when, when some kind of argument starts or there's some kind of fuss over a person with disabilities or just somebody that, uh, you know, is doing something that somebody objects to, that maybe the situation could be diffused before it escalates into some kind of crime. Seems like prevention should be one of our best weapons. Um. Well, I am uh, more security and enforcement related, but that, that has that is being discussed. Uh, I believe um, it is being reviewed, and it's they're looking into the feasibility of doing that. So it, it has not been dismissed. Um, our security personnel, as part of their state of Illinois mandated training, also received de-escalation training. The Chicago Police Department, I can tell you, has extensive de-escalation training. So um, those issues are being addressed as, as well. Yep, so they aren't uh, just doing it. Uh, they just aren't arresting people everywhere. The other issue is, is we are trying to make it more difficult for people to fare evade onto the system. Um, one thing we we tend to find is that every almost every crime starts with uh, a very small crime, which is usually fair evasion. So um, we're trying to make it more difficult for people to uh, get on without paying. And uh, a lot of them abuse the the ADA gates quite quite often. So we're trying to work with uh, to make sure that we do not impact anyone's uh anyone that is uh ADA has ADA needs uh we do not impact their ability to access the system but make it more difficult for somebody to uh basically uh fair evade onto the system so that's a couple of things if we feel if we can keep them off the system to begin with we won't have to deal with any fights with them on the system later Thank you, Mary, for your question. I have um, a couple of questions myself. Um, you mentioned the training, and it seems like um, you mentioned there being an influx of private um, uh, uh, people coming in to help patrol. Um, and I just kind of want to make sure if that same level of training that, you know, um, CTA um, employees get and that the police are getting with the de-escalation if that is also being a standard for third-party people who come in? Well, as I said, the third the the companies do provide de-escalation training. Um, no, they don't get the same level. They, it would be the, the police department gets extensive training on it. Um, CTA, I think, gets some basic training on it, but it's not the same level. These uh, the security personnel are not. Um, it, it would be feasibly financially very high to give them that level of training. Um, they they are 
while they're paid well, they they are not paid at the same pay level as a police officer. So they do not get that that much as much training as the police officers get. Don't forget, police officers probably get over a week of it and then get brought in every year for for extra training. Uh, the security personnel get it every year. Um, they may get part of their training. It's mostly recognizing and basic de-escalation techniques, how to not inflame a situation so you can get professional first responders on scene as well. Um, so out of curiosity, kind of keeping that in mind with, um, I think you said there's 300 of these um, third party people. Um, is Have you seen or received any, I guess, complaints between just user, you know, writer interaction um, and having issues with the third party versus CTA staff or or the other police officers. Um, and, and I guess that that's just a question because it seems like there are um, a quite a many more of the third party than, than the other kind. Um, are you asking if we get complaints about the security guards? Yeah, so in terms of, um, you know, uh, their complaints come in, um, you know, get sent in. And I was wondering if you have some sure. sort of idea yeah. if there have been. Yeah, like, with that many people, I mean, we, we get complaints on them. We get, you know, police officers get complaints. CTA employees get complaints. Uh, we investigate them all. Uh, any there are, are egregious or, or inappropriate or very inappropriate, we remove them from the system. And we tell the companies they are not able to hire that person. They, I can't tell a company they can't hire somebody, but I can tell them they can't work on our system. So we've removed over 60, uh, 64, 65 uh, security guards for uh, inappropriate behavior. We have auditors. We have auditors out every night, every day, uh, monitoring, investigating, stuff like that. Thank you so much for that um, information. I do have one last question um, and then I'm gonna open it up to someone else to sneak in a question before, before we move on. Um, but I, my question is more about the distribution of uh, police officers. Is it kind of um, evenly distributed with the neighborhoods that we're seeing like more officers come again or is it kind of localized and more touristy areas or more, you know, you know, um, and how has that kind of looked? Well. Number one, that, that question has to be answered by the police department. But I can tell you basically uh, the policing is not done and we, we put 10 policemen here, here, and here, here. It's you put policemen where they're needed. So uh, where policemen are needed, there tends to be higher numbers. Where where things are quieter, there, they, there tends to be smaller numbers. Um, mass transit. Uh, it, it same with mass transit locations. Um, you'll see more police just because of the influx of personnel. It's, or you the, put policemen users are users and customers in the loop in your near north area, um, because that's a huge chunk of our our ridership. Also, there's homeland security issues, as you can imagine, downtown. Um, we also have uh, put large quantities, or there's there's patrols at our bigger stations along the red line, uh, in the blue line, uh, on the west side. So it depends what's going on, but the police department, I mean, public transportation section patrols the whole system, and the 22 districts each pay attention to their their little piece of what they have of the CTA as well. So. It, it kind of it ebbs and flows, to be honest with you. It, it, nothing is stagnant there. Thanks so much, Kevin. This this definitely kind of paints a fuller picture for me. Um, thanks so much for answering my questions. Um, before I move forward, I want to open it up to um, the rest of the committee members, see if there's a question. Laura, I think I, see, I saw your hand. Yeah, I have a question. Um, you mentioned that one reason you were looking at fair evasion was it, was it led to other crimes. I was wondering if you have data for that and not just that like someone who is who is later arrested for a crime fair evaded, but like that that impeding fair evasion reduces other crimes 
Uh, we have probably anecdotal data. Um, when we follow up a, a crime, we often find, uh, if we go back, we, we see the fare evasion because we usually look to see how that person got onto the system. Um, so I have, you know, we have anecdotal data on it. Um, we, we haven't, you know, we're actually have a meeting after this. I have, uh, I have a fair evasion meeting with the CTA. So, but we're looking to try to, uh, we, we don't want to arrest everybody. We just want to stop the, 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 you know, the fair evasion itself. If we can stop that, we can stop a lot of people that have ill intent um, from getting on the system. And I'm not saying everybody that flips the turnstile is out to be a crook, but a lot of the people that do it do, do end up involved in other uh, crimes. I have a, uh, this is Michael Kaiser. I have a question. Do you have, um, information about the level of and type of uh, crimes on other big systems uh, that we might uh, get some perspective on the Chicago situation? Um, I don't have it readily available. It's it's if you look on their websites, most of them have it. Um, New York City. Uh, I, I can tell you our our crime rate is better than the rest of the city and the CTA. Um, I can tell you it's probably akin to New York's or Philadelphia's. Uh, don't forget New York has a much bigger system and New York has uh, about 2000 officers assigned to its subways. So um, it's, it's, there's a lot of apples and oranges going on there, you know, and we're kind of, you know, we're much, even though LA is a bigger city, they're very bus centric and less trained. So it's, it's kind of hard to do that. Um, I can tell you, I haven't, I've been so focused on CTA. I haven't really looked at too much our comparisons right now. I've, I've been more focused on where we're coming from, where it was before the pandemic and where we're headed. I, um, and by the way, how uh, maybe you said this before, how many officers are on the CTA? Uh, I didn't say it. Uh, that's a police department number that the, they put out. I don't, I don't have that. You, you don't know that? No. Well, I, I think that it would be good for uh, the committee to, or the advisory committee, to have the comparisons to other systems uh, and to have, uh, including the types of crimes that are committed on the CTA. And of course, it's going to be a matter of per mile of track or what, you know, whatever, and also the number of officers that are on the CTA. But so it, I, I, li yeah. I like to request them for whoever might provide it. Absolutely. I'll see if we can get you some uh, stats from other cities. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you so much, Michael, for your question and Laura for your question. Thank you so much, Kevin, for taking the time and talking to us and um, and for um, answering all the questions that, that we have for you today. Um, if there aren't any more questions, we are going to uh, move on to the next item on our agenda. Um, we have the new bus fare box, which is going to be presented by William Trumbull, um, General Manager of Fares Systems Operation. Hello, Whitney. Can you hear me? Yes, hear you loud and clear. Thank you. My name, my name is Bill Trumbull. Um, I'm a very young 61 year old white male with brown eyes and brown curly hair, wearing an orange shirt with blue stripes. And it was the brightest shirt for the warmest day of the year that I could find in my closet. Um, behind me is an open window, which uh, I think is making a little bit of a backlit situation, but we'll, we'll go with it. Um, we are getting new fare boxes. And if I can share my screen here, um, can you see that? 
or not yet? Yes, we can see it. Thank you. Okay. Um, so there's a few people on this call from the CTA that have worked on this project with me for a very long time. Um, but we are getting new fare boxes. Um, so these are the, uh, the old fare boxes. They're almost 40 years old, um, held together with uh, rubber bands and duct tape. Uh, we have a a group of technicians that have been maintaining them for all of this time. Uh, on the right hand side is a picture of the fare box in its current configuration on a bus with the Ventra card reader that you're all familiar with and uh, attached to the yellow stanchion at the entrance way um, at, to a, at the doorway of the bus. Um, do I have control of this or do you hear it? Okay. Um, so the, the existing fare boxes, like I said, they're almost 40 years old and they are, um, they're just obsolete. The operator has to log into the unit separately aside from the rest of the, what they need to do to operate the bus. Um, the, the bill register doesn't actually know the difference between a $1 bill or a $10 bill or a piece of paper cut to the right size. So we do get some um, counterfeit bills slipped in through the fare boxes and just the technology at the time wasn't able to identify um, the denomination of bills. The new ones will be able to do that. Um, it's a standalone system. It's not integrated with anything else on the bus. Because of that, there was uh, some delays in the accounting process of the cash that we collected. And as I mentioned, the mechanical components um, required almost constant maintenance, uh, just like anything else that would be 40 years old. Um, any questions on the existing fare box? Okay, great. Now, now I'll switch to the new one. So several years, you know, we kind of made the decision to replace the fare boxes um, with some real primary objectives and the first one is to maintain the cash payment option for customers because there are occasional riders, tourists, um, just, you know, general public that use cash to get on our buses and, and we'd like to wanted to maintain that option. Um, we also wanted to improve the, um, the bus operators environment and give them a single login situation and make the customer interface better. So the new fare boxes will be integrated with the Ventra card reader and some of the other bus operating systems. We will get real time ridership and revenue information off of the buses. So when a bus is out on the, um, on the route, it will communicate ridership and revenue information, much like we get the Ventra data now, only now we'll be getting it for all of our riders. Um, the, the part that nobody ever sees uh, with a um, fare box system is that that money then has to be taken out of the bus in a, in a cash box, dumped into a secure vault, uh, consolidated from multiple buses overnight. Uh, and then that vault has to be collected and taken to a place where it gets counted and deposited. So all of that will be new operations at our seven bus garages. There'll be new vaulting operations which will also improve in efficiencies in the, in the operations. Um, and then we'll have more accuracy in the cash that we're collecting and where we're collecting it. And when some of these, these devices have defects, we can get them repaired quicker. So those are all the things we wanted to accomplish with the new fare box. And we put out a bid and we evaluated several options. And if you could now go to the next slide, we picked a company out of Germany called Scheidt and Bachmann. Um, the fare box fits exactly into the existing fare box location. Uh, it will have a larger customer display screen that will provide more information than what the customers get now. There will be audio signals to recognize fare payments. Um, it will recognize different denominations, so we will know more accurately what we're collecting. Um, there'll be a real-time network. So we may not need to vault every bus every night and we'll identify the defects. 
And then most importantly to bus operations is it will have an integrated control unit. So the bus operator will just have to log in once. It will get the route and run data. It will integrate with Ventra and communicate that information. Um, and it will reduce the number of screens that the operator has to manage uh, at the front of the bus. So all of those are, are very good things. Go ahead. So uh, we, we did a site visit to one of the garages and we stuck the new fare boxes into multiple um, different series of buses. I think there's about seven or eight different types of bus entrance ways that we're going to have to accommodate. Um, and so this photograph has a picture of where the bill slot will be located, the coin slot, and the size of the passenger display. Uh, again, it'll, it'll take the same footprint as the existing one with the um, Ventra card reader right in front. Um, the reason we had to do this seven or eight different times is because there, there's not a lot of real estate in the front of the bus. So you've got yellow stanchions, you've got the ramp that lifts up for people with wheelchairs or uh, carts. Uh, and so that has to be clear. The, op the bus operator has to be able to get in to their seat and close the security door behind them. And you want to keep the front as uncluttered as possible so the operator has the maximum amount of visibility in the front of the bus. So every bus series is going to have a slightly different modification and, and it will have to go through multiple iterations before we kind of get it right on every bus. If you go to the next picture, this is I have uh, this is on the 8000 series, the, the Nova buses um, showing the existing fare box. Uh, with then the new one, uh, the existing one is on the left and then the location of the new one is, is on the right. Um, so that's one possible configuration. The next slide is the 4,000 series buses, again with the old fare box and how that sits in there and then the new fare box right next to it. Um, there, we will go out in the field with uh, Irma, I think you'll be with us and bus operations and bus engineering and bus maintenance and, and there'll be a, a whole committee of people that will go out and look at each configuration um, to make a final decision as how to, it should be installed and, and what the exact positioning of the Ventra card reader and the fare box um, will be. So, so final configurations are still are a work in progress. Um, yeah, I think there's, there's one more slide maybe, or is that the end? Yep, yeah, that's the end. So that's what the new fare boxes will look like. Uh, we're in you know design with the company right now. The software has to be developed. The garage work infrastructure needs to be done. We will start with um, putting the fare boxes this fall, probably in September or October, on 100 buses out of the Chicago garage. And we're gonna run that pilot for, uh, for six months, just to work out any kinks in the collection system. And then once uh, we approve that operation, we will then go on a several month uh, um, working overnight to install new fare boxes, one garage at a time until we get all seven, it will probably finish in late 24. It's about a year and a half to two year implementation schedule. Mike, I know you've got a question. <laughs> Anyone else? Barbara? Yeah, it's Barbara again. I, I was looking at the slides before the presentation um, and I was seeing that the um, the new fare box in relation to the old fare box, it looks like it's a taller unit. I, I, it's hard to tell in the photos, but it, just in perspective of where the, the steering wheel is on the on the bus, it looked like it, it pretty much covered that. So I was wondering about the reach height to the 
the bill slot and the coin slot as far as um, accessibility. Yeah, sorry, that may be a, a um, artifact of the photograph, um, just the angle that the picture was taken at. They are essentially the same height. And in fact, the bill, um, the bill slot and the coin slot are a little bit lower because they're set down on the hood of the card reader. Um, so, but we can't, the height is really dictated by the platform that's at, that's structurally part of the bus. And that is different on almost every series of buses. So there's not a lot we can do to adjust the height up or down um, just based on the, the structure of the bus. So, but it, it'll be pretty much the same. I, I assume that if you ever had a passenger that was, you know, had an issue with that reach height, the, the driver assists, is that kind of the typical protocol? I think that's in their SOP, the standard operating procedures now. Um, and certainly we're gonna go through a, a pretty thorough, one thing I didn't mention is we're gonna have to train the operators on this new system, the new software, uh, the new log on. So, so there'll be plenty of opportunities to train the operators on the functionality. And that would certainly be something I think would be included in it. Thank you. Um, I, this is Whitney. I have a question. Th and thank you, Barbara, for your, for your question. Um, I kind of have two questions a little bit back to back. Um, the first one was about the display, um, the new display that's being added. Um, can you kind of paint a picture a little bit of of what's going to be on that display, um, like how big the font your testing is going to be? And you mentioned audio components, but I was wondering if there's other um, visual components that are going to be on the display that are new features that might be hard to translate um, if someone cannot actually see it. Yeah, so... Um... So we don't know what the sounds are going to be and what the, the would probably just indi indicate a full fare payment or a reduced fare payment or, you know, the bill gets rejected because it didn't go in straight. Um, I think would be kind of the standard noise audio component. The um, we're just gearing up now to um, make the the visual the the display synchronized with the Ventra card reader display. So like when you tap and it, it doesn't, um, you don't, it doesn't read your card. It'll say, please tap again, or you'll read, please tap again, or uh, you get a go signal. Um, so we're going to coordinate it visually with colors and symbols. So it mimics what people see are familiar with in the Ventra system that will also be um, duplicated on the screen that the operator can see. So they will know if somebody puts a dollar in and it doesn't get accepted, the operator will see, you know, bill not accepted. Or so then they would know to, to like, as somebody, we just said, give assistance to that particular customer. So we're gonna make it look as much like and sound as much like the Ventra system as we can. Thank you. Um, and my quick second question yeah. is, I couldn't quite tell from the picture, um, but is the coin slot and the bill slot, are they reversed in the new model? Um, they are. They okay. Are. Do you foresee any, um, a learning curve, I guess, with writers who maybe for 40 years might have been, you know, <laughs> I, think, I think especially of, of people who might have lower vision and they're used to, you know, kind of a, a very set setup. Well, one of the things I think we learned when we transitioned to the Ventra card readers is that there's always a learning curve. People will, you know, always fall back on whatever their previous behaviors were um, or won't understand a new system. So, you know, I, we will have an, a, a customer education campaign as well to roll these things out. And that's, you know, that's a pretty obvious difference. Um, that we'll try to communicate as clearly as possible. But those were, those were two very good questions. Yeah, thank you so much, Bill, for, for your answers. Um, before we move on to the next item, I wanna make sure, um, see if there's any other committee members who might have a question for Bill. 
Okay. Well, Bill. Um, again- yeah. I'm sorry. Hello. Yeah. When are these going to, I know the, the pilot phase is going to be for six months and that's going to start. When is that going to start? Probably in October. Okay. So we're not looking until um, second quarter of 2024 for these to actually be rolled out like yes. officially. Yes. Um, and that's okay. Cause going. I know um, the, well, okay, you you mentioned about the customer education campaign. So, um, yeah, we can address more questions later. So, okay, thanks. Great, okay. Bill, thank you so much. Um, if we don't have any more questions, I uh, just want to thank you again, Bill, for um, sharing your presentation, for, for uh, painting a really good picture of um, what we should expect um, by the fall. Thank you All so right. much. Thank you. And- Whitney, I just wanted to add, and, and, and Bill can confirm, uh, this is Elsa um, speaking. Um, when we do have the customer ca- campaign out, we can definitely share it with the committee so that they have that information in advance, um, given that some of it will be in print. Some of it might, I'm not sure if it's going to be um, an audio or a video of some sort, but whatever is developed uh, once it's ready to go externally. Since this is a new product and we want to reach as many people as possible, um, once it's ready, we'll be happy to share it with the committee, even if there's not a meeting, and we can just uh, send it to um, the list so that they have it in advance, and then they can share it with others um, who are using either the agencies that represent or other um, organizations that could kind of spread the word um, in this partnership, because we know it like Bill mentioned, it change, you know, it changes hard for everybody, but we want to make sure that everybody kind of has the information to be able to interact with it in a way that makes sense and, and so forth, um, in addition to the support they'll get from the operator or customer service rep um, if it's at a real estate. Oh, sorry, it won't be at the real station. Oh, just in case. Do you foresee the training um, being um, like instructions? And this is Whitney, by the way. Do you see the training being instructions printed as well as the opportunity to maybe visit a bus that has it installed? Or is it kind of still maybe a little bit up in the air of how, how that might look? Yeah, I think I don't think we've made all those decisions yet, but they're going to come up quickly because we want to get these on 100 buses in the fall. So, okay. And, and, uh, <laughs> Oh, and, and I'm sorry, Dury, uh, and real fast, do you, do you foresee the um, training kind of outliving the six-month pilot? Like, will this be kind of um, a little bit more of an ongoing training past the pilot? Well, for the operators, you mean? Uh, for um, for riders who might still need to get acclimated to the setup. Yeah, I, I think we'll do it as long as we need to until people are comfortable with it. Yeah. Right. Thank you, Bill. And I'm sorry, Dury? That's okay. Yeah. Um, I, it, when he just said, you know, this kind of, this stuff kind of creeps up on you. And so, um, in ca- just in case stuff is going to be starting to be in the works, I wanted to mention a few things, um, um, to try to incorporate into the customer education campaign. Um, one, um, when, you know, like the idea of, well, I, I know it was a question, um, but, um, we have done, um, visits, if you will, in the past, um, when they've, when they've rolled out new um, train cars or new bus series, we've um, even um, your um, visit to the Western um, Station. Um, so, if they, if that could be, um, you know, something even before the pilot phase, um, you know, for the committee to kind of just to go visit, um, to go view, and um, but then when it's closer to the rollout, I know um, in the past for the committee, they've, um, they've like when, when they had the, what are those things? Um, the platforms downtown for the buses. Um, I know um, formerly for the committee, they've um, reached out to the um, disability community to, um, have on-site training um and if that's something that do you, do you know what I'm referring to yeah I'll just yes. I'll just say that it was the loop link 
Yes. Green, that's yes. What okay. About. So yes. So something similar to that with the fair boxes would be great, but also incorporating into the campaign. Um, if you're going to be doing bus announcements, you know, on the, on the buses, there's different PSAs all the time, you know, like different automated announcements about no food and drink. Um, if customers wear backpacks, please remove them, blah, blah, blah. And then sometimes they will mention things, upcoming things with the CTA. It might be beneficial to um, somehow um, incorporate, you know, those in, into the automated announcements but also um, on the CTA's website. Um, and then even, you know, any anywhere, um, you know, obviously brochures and stuff like that, but I'm thinking the CTA website um, as well as um, the automated announcements. And then if you do them on the CTA website to make sure that they're screen reader friendly, not just images that are unreadable. <laughs> No, no, right. They should be videos of these actual yeah. functions. Well, or if if it's if it's um, if it's not videos, if it's text, make sure it's a text. Or if it's an image, make sure it's an image with um, alt text, so that people who use screen readers it'll read it aloud. Mm -hmm. So. Thank you, Doreen. Uh, Barbara. Yeah, and I know. Um, it's hard to do on a, on the bus line versus the trains where you have the stations, but um, you know, some type of customer service, you know, field people or whatever, I think are still important. Um, I remember when Ventra came out, something about when Ventra came out was, a, was at the same time, I don't remember what step in the Ventra process, but it was the same weekend as the Chicago Marathon. And I remember coming home from work at mid, I get off at Midway. I remember staying at the station for two hours, helping people coming in on the, from the airplanes, not knowing what to do to get a Ventra card because that was what they needed to do at the time. So there wasn't really any customer service people there. So I just hung out and helped people. Um, so I think some type of face-to-face -face component to it I know it's harder to do it because it's buses, but, um, you know, so I don't know what to suggest for it, but, you know, um, and I think this is not the same as the Ventra card, but, um, you know, there may need to be some type of, you know, person or whatever um, that's that's there, you know. I, I, can't, I can't think of what to suggest, but it, it I just remember when Ventra came out and I just helped people and then I kept, I had to leave to go home, you know, but. <laughs> well, uh, this is Doreen again. I know um, I've seen occasionally when drivers are in training, um, there's another CTA representative on the bus. So there's two and it might be, you know, I, yeah, that I, I understand you can't coordinate that all the time, but you know, you might want to, um, you know, on, on routes that you think, you know, might people might need more assistance, if you will, perhaps um, trying to coordinate with routes where there, where there is going to be driver training so that there are two representatives, the driver and then the, the other CTA person who's assisting. So it'll kind of, you know, they can adjust both. <laughs> right. This is Just an idea. This Thank is you. Way I, I know that in the past and the wayfinding subcommittee, there's been um, constant talk about like a no before you go page on CTA, um, which I, you know, I oh, feel, yeah. yeah, I feel like with what we're a lot we're talking about with making sure that, you know, not only is the information compiled in an easy format for people, but also all that accessibility information is in a similar easy to digest and access um place on CTA's website um and no before go pages and everything else are incredibly popular um you know um just across the board so it is something that I think um if people are looking out for it they're going to be happy that it's there and um and already used to what is going to be presented on on the page in terms of information um 
Um, and unless there's any other questions, I'd like to move on to the next item on the agenda. I just want to hold it open. Um, Okay, um, I want to thank um, Doreen and Barbara for, for your questions. I want to thank you so much, um, Bill, for, for taking the time and for talking to us and for answering all of our questions about the, the fair box and, and what we need to expect. Um, next on the agenda, we have RTA programs update, which is going to be presented by Mark Kolchak, uh, Division Manager of Customer Programs. Hi, everybody. Can you hear me, Whitney? Yes, you sound perfectly clear. Okay, good. Thanks for having me and for inviting me both, um, Irma and Whitney. My name is Mark Koljak, as, as was already said. I manage the customer programs on behalf of the RTA, which include reduced fare, ride-free, as well as ADA paratransit. Um, I'm going to share my screen here. I hope that part works. Okay. Good. Yes, we can we can see your screen. Okay, perfect. Um, so I will say that I am a Caucasian male and I go by he, him, his, and um, I'm wearing a navy blue collar dress shirt right now. And I am very happy to be with you on the screen as an introductory slide. And it says essentially the RTA presentation and today's date with our new RTA branding. And the next slide that I have on the screen is what I'll be talking about. And that's first the Reduce Fair and Ride Free programs. I'm going to present an overview and then talk about some of the statistics, particularly relevant. Um, as the pandemic period hit us um, in 2020 through, you know, literally for three years. Um, then I'm going to talk about ADA paratransit certification, a brief overview, as well as those statistics. The slide that I have on the screen now um, has a heading called Reduce Fare Program Eligibility. I won't spend a lot of time on the actual programs because most people on this call and presentation know a lot of this information. But the eligibility for the reduced fare program, which is which is half fare for those who are phone eligible, requires a completed application, a government issued ID that is valid and not expired. It requires a passport size photo, which can be taken um, as a passport photo at a place like Walgreens or CVS, et cetera, or it can also be a digital photo taken as a selfie or um, by submitting it via email. Proof of disability includes doctor's documentation, social security letter indicating disability, a VA letter, a Medicare letter, um, or an Illinois uh, driver's license or ID um, that indicates disability. Um, for ride free, applicants who are found eligible must be at least 16 years old and have a disability or be over the age of 65. Why ride free is different than reduced fare, number one, it's managed by the state of Illinois Department on Aging. So there is a threshold requirement uh, that the state has put in place. So a one person household as of right now, and the state can change these at their discretion. The minimum income requirements for a one person household is 33,562. For a two person household, it's 44,533. And for a household of three or more, it's $55,500. And the state requires proof of income. And also a state of Illinois ID or driver's license. It's really important to remember for ride free eligibility that the application is only digital. It can only be submitted through the state of Illinois Department on Aging. There is no paper applications that they accept. So 
what I want to talk about now is a comparison of the permit types who were eligible pre-pandemic, which is up through 2019, and then post-pandemic is from 2021 Q4 through the present um, end of year data, 2022 Q4. So in 2020, through the first half of 2021, the, R the RTA was offering auto renewals for reduced fare and ride-free permits. And in 2022, we resumed regular operations. And to date, we continue to see a decline in eligible customers in all four areas. Reduced fare, both senior as well as disabled reduced fare, as well as ride-free senior as well as disabled um, customers who ride for free. Um, so the main reasons for it is that um, during that during that period, um, during when we did auto renewals, in other words, no questions asked, we did not um, want to have people leaving their homes, you know, bringing their applications, going to the post office, mailing applications, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so many people, though, after the auto extensions expired, they did not seek renewal. So we've seen a significant decrease in those who are who have permits who can ride the system. In addition, there was a significant impact on people who are deceased. Um, so we process deceased customers on a monthly basis. What we are seeing is since the very end of 2019, through year end last year, there's a 14% decrease in senior reduced fare permit holders, a 26% decrease in senior right free permit holders, a 42% decrease for people who have disabilities riding for free, and a 9% decrease in disability holders of reduced fare, reduced fare permits. For ADA paratransit certification, um, that's a service, as everyone probably knows, it's operated by PACE in the RTA region. It is an advanced reservation origin to destination public transportation service. For people who have disabilities or health conditions that prevent them, some or all of the time, from using fixed route service. The eligible the eligibility portion is the determinations for ADA paratransit eligibility are made in accordance with the Federal Americans with Disabilities Act, as well as the U.S. Department of Transportation ADA regulations. We follow an in-person interview process for new customers, as well as accompanying functional assessments. For recertification applicants, we follow a 30-minute telephone interview. <clears throat> that has recently changed because we were processing only paper applications throughout the pandemic to again make it more convenient for customers. Um, the reason we are implementing um, the 30 minute recertification phone interviews, it's a pilot and we wanted to, and customers have received it extremely well and sure that we're talking to them versus just processing um, a 12 page application. Um, so we'll continue to monitor that pilot, which concludes in May of 2023. Um, eligibility, make sure that all completed applications must have a certification decision made within 21 calendar days of the submission date. If not, a presumptive eligibility is given until the certification decision is made. <clears throat> Similarly, for ADA paratransit, the 21 and 22 numbers are really negatively impacted due to the COVID-19 pandemic. In addition, all deceased customers have been removed from the database on a monthly basis. Finally, applicants who were found eligible on a temporary basis during COVID-19 and due to COVID-19 
those were found eligible during the 2020 calendar year. Many of them did not re request um, continued service. So we can see at the end of 2020, there was 64,506 eligible ADA customers. And from that point in time through the end of 2022, it reduced to 56,026 people. So that's over the course of that time, a 13% decrease. So that's some of the um, important pieces as to why these decreases are in place or occurred for all three of these um, significant programs. Um, so that is what I wanted to share with everybody. Um, it is important, it is significant. Uh, the pandemic really had significant impacts on um, many, many people, in, in, including those who use and take advantage of reduced fare ride free as well as ADA paratransit. So can I open it up for questions? Um, I'll be happy to help answer anything that you have. This is Whitney. Um, I have a question. Um, I, I want to thank you um, real fast for, for this wonderful presentation. Um, the question that I have is uh, you talked about um, at the beginning of the presentation that there was a switch between um, being able to mail in applications to now being um, virtual. And I know um, that for a lot of people who might um, especially kind of qualify for for some of these um these fare reductions having access to technology is still kind of tricky for a lot of people um i was wondering if you found any correlation with the decrease of signups to be with just access not people not being able to fully access the application be able to fill them out in the way that that they need to yeah, so it's a good question, Whitney. So what's really important is when we were using full applications for everything, and again, we still have full paper applications for reduced fare and ride free, and we have a digital option for those two programs. For ADA paratransit, it's always been this cumbersome 12 page application and people will call and say, I have a health condition or a disability condition, I want to apply, then we would mail them an application. And with the US Postal Service in our region being as challenging as it's been, the call would come a week later, I never received my application, we'd mail another one. Call would come another two weeks later, still haven't received it, we'd mail another one. So then at that point, we would have to take some of those folks on their third third round and do it over the telephone. So what we decided to do was eliminate the application completely. So now they call us and say, hi, everything was fine yesterday. I had a, I'll give an example, I had a stroke and now I'm unable to use the system. I wanna apply for ADA paratransit. What we do is, we mail or email them just a qualifying flyer that describes the program. And on the flyer is four questions that they answer themselves. And based on their answers, if they say yes to any one of them, we tell them, you may qualify for ADA paratransit service. Please call us to schedule an interview appointment. So at this point, there is no paper anywhere. There is no digital requirement anywhere. We then schedule them for a one hour interview appointment, which has always been the process. So what we eliminated is the back and forth of mail time, back and forth and back and forth. And we eliminated any digital needs of certain people cannot, they don't have access. They're less able to use online applications, online um, ways to interact, to provide us information. So we just schedule them an interview appointment, then they come to one of our two interview locations. And then we take all the information that used to be on a 12 page application, including their demographics, and we incorporated that right into the interview. So therefore, 
We're not losing any information. We have a complete picture of each applicant, all the information that we've had all along, and the processing time is so much less than what it was because we're eliminating back and forth with lost mail, customer frustration, they're angry, they think we're not mailing it, and you know, of course that's not the case, but it, it's frustrating for the customer. So we looked at it as how can we eliminate that? When they come in, we still do their physical assessments if needed. We do the cognitive assessments and we continue to do a very thorough job in making proper eligibility decisions for each customer as an individual. So we're really happy with it. The feedback has been fantastic so far. Um, I've presented it at various ADA operating committee meetings and the, the amount of positive um, feedback has been really, really great. So does that answer your question, though, Whitney? It, it certainly does. Thank you so much for um, just really thoroughly explaining the details of that, because it sounds very unique. And I think most of us are probably used to the other way of it not working, which is now with, there's a digital barrier. So this was really informative, and and um, I really appreciate you taking the time to answer that. Um, I also want to, though, chime in real quick, if I may. For those people who have been certified, typically it's a four year certification. So they're eligible for four years and then it expires. So again, it used to be, hi, Mr. Customer, you're gonna be expiring in two months. Please fill out this paper application and either mail it or call us for an interview, same problem. So what we did for them is we said, you're going to be expiring, call us to schedule a 30 minute phone interview. And then we schedule it and we make the outbound call to the customer at that appointed time. And I was really concerned as a number of people were that no one's going to answer the phone. They're just not going to be there for this. It's not a doctor appointment, but yet it's important. So we have had only a 2% no-show rate on those phone calls. Absolutely amazing so thrilled about it and the feedback from the customers is thank god we're talking to you instead of just mailing this application and then not knowing when we're going to get an answer so they're loving interacting with us we get a better feel for how they're doing than just not speaking to them at all but yet it doesn't require them to come into the office so it's just such when a did that start so we've been piloting it since the beginning of February. So it goes February through May, and then we'll publish Got it. results. And you know, I would that'll then determine whether it becomes a permanent part of the process, which is what what I'm really hoping for because it has mm -hmm. been so well received by the disability community. So, anyways, wanted um, to. I have in. a question. I have a question about that. This is Doreen from MOPD. For Hi, people Doreen. who are deaf or hard of hearing. Um, do you do a video um, call or do you um, use the relay? What do you? It's the customer's discretion if that's how they want to conduct the interview over the phone, of course. Okay. And then the other question that I have is, um, um, I, I too appreciate yeah. that you explained um, the um, paratransit. Um, however, to Whitney's question of the um, lack of technology that some people may not have access to, um, what about, um, I can see that, what about for um, reduced fare and especially ride free? Because ride free, it, you don't, is, is all digital now. Yeah. And so, that, I mean, yes, there are places like our office that will assist people in completing the application, but um, still, um, do you, like with Whitney's question, do you, um, how does that, in, in terms of the way you've evaluated it, how does that factor into it? Because, you know, a lot of people do not have access to the technology or, is the website even screen reader compliant? You know, is it is it is it screen reader accessible? So let me address both pieces of what you're bringing up, Doreen. First, let's talk about the ride-free portion. So mm -hmm. again, 
we have to remember that the ride free application is managed, put out, and completely controlled by the state of Illinois Department of IDOA, Energy. right, right. I so get the, that. The RTA has nothing to do with how that's implemented. All we can do is provide customers with locations to go to get Point a well taken. Thank you. Yeah. No, it, yeah. it's okay because we get it all the time, you know, on our customer service lines. And if it was us managing it, it would probably look a little different for sure. Knowing exactly what you said, there's screen reader technologies, there's people who are not able to take advantage um, of some of the electronic means. So the state has made those decisions. But then once they're, once applicants, people who want to apply for the ride free programs are completed with that, then we get notice, they've been approved. So then we then go back and interact with them and we print their permits. No questions asked, they, um, they then just get them mailed after we print them because the eligibility has been met by the state of Illinois. So that's, that's on, you know, it's a challenging part with ride free. However, what we can completely control is reduced fare, which we do. Right. So for reduced fare, we have offerings of still doing it paper for people who want to do it by mail. And we process them very quickly. Once we once we get the paper, it's scanned, and we have decision makers live right there while it's scanned to approve them or not approve them. And typically, when it's not approved, they're missing something. They didn't submit something, um, and then we communicate mm -hmm. with customers right away. And for those who want to apply electronically, we have a brand new portal that we just launched um, a year ago. And that portal allows all these customers to interact, apply electronically without having to leave their, their house. And they can, what's great about it too is people who have smartphones, it works perfectly. You can't really see it that well, but I'm holding my smartphone up. Um, and do you so, know, does that mean web access guidelines? I'm web sorry? content access guidelines, excuse me? I don't know the answer to that. I'd, I'd have to find out, Doreen. So okay. it was, yeah, it was clearly, there are web content access guidelines for screen readers. So it was, it was all vetted through people who use screen readers. So during our testing, um, we had two people who tested it using screen readers. So I, I, I would have to get back to you on that if that's okay. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. Yeah. For your question. Um, do we have any other questions at the moment from the committee? Okay. Well, I want to um, thank you again, Mark, for so much for taking the time, for talking to us, answering all of our questions, um, and, and just really thoroughly kind of painting the, the path for us. I keep saying painting a clear picture for us, but this is why we have these meetings. It's really informative. Um, so thank you so much. Um, and if we don't have any other questions for Mark, we can move forward to the next item on our agenda. Okay, so we are going to move over to subcommittee reports. Um, and so, um, yeah, we have three subcommittees at the moment. Um, funding and advocacy, I want to say, um, needs a chair if you are interested in joining the, fun the funding uh, advocacy um, subcommittee or uh, want to be the chair, please. Uh, contact Irma, same for the safety and training and technology uh, subcommittee that also needs a chair. Um, and then as of after today, the wayfinding subcommittee, um, where I am the former chair, um, today is my last meeting. So uh, the wayfinding subcommittee is also um, has a great group already formed, um, a wonderful group of people who've been really helpful over the past four years with including their input. If you are looking to join that group, um, also please reach out to, to Irma. Um, next on our list is the uh, facilitators report. Um, I'm going to kick it over to uh, Irma Gomez, a manager of ADA compliance programs. Thank you, Whitney. Um, and first, I would like to say uh, again, thank you, Whitney, for your leadership. Um, I don't think I speak for myself when I say that I truly appreciate 
learning from you and seeing you flourish as chair as short as it was. Um, we will miss you and wish you the best of luck in your next projects. Uh, you're always welcome here at CTA and your feedback and voice is much appreciated. So thank you. Um, and we will be sending our nominations for new chair and vice chair. Uh, we'll follow up with the committee about these nominations. We will also be opening up the committee applications again. The date is still to be determined, but we will communicate with the committee um, and the community uh, when they are open. So please stay tuned um, when these announcements go out. Uh, furthermore, um, I also wanted to announce um, that for future meetings, um, the governor's emergency proclamation expires around May. Um, so the committee will need to hold in-person meetings and uh, or hybrid meetings, um, and we'll be, we will need a quorum to hold a meeting. So since there are 10 appointed members, uh, a quorum would be at least six, so 51 percent. Uh, and uh, so for in order for the meeting to be held, we will need six present members um, to hold the meeting. Um, and in-person public comment will also now be open as of July's meeting, um, but we will also continue to have a virtual option for those who can't be present. Um, and while we move to hybrid, uh, the meetings can also be more interactive and hands-on as we can have like a bus, uh, for example, uh, a bus with the new fare box for the committee to see in person. So there are positives um, and more possibilities for direct feedback um, and community building within the, the committee. Um, I am also moving on to uh, addressing the public comment that was posted um, last meeting from Adam Ballard. Um, he stated the issue um, with the 5000 series, real cars not kneeling to the level and uh, he him almost missing the train. Um, so basically this, the 5000 series cars are not designed to tilt towards the platform um, so as to remove the need of a gap filler. Um, and about half of our cars in the 5000 series do lower um, to better meet the platform height, but not all of them. So uh, they do lower to about three inches to reach the height of 50, 42 inches, um, the top of the rail on which the car's uh, wheels run. Uh, this 42 inch height is the CTA design standard for the height of the platform um, from top of the rail as well. The 5,000 5, cars uh, are usually about 45 inches from the top of the rail while in operation between stations and lower to 42 inches in about three seconds um, when stopped in a station. They raise as they are pulling out after the doors are shut. The reason for the higher floor level while in operation is that these cars uh, need to equip uh, fitted underneath the car, which requires them to be 45 inches for top of rail during normal operation to maintain proper clearance. Uh, the gap filler is intended to be deployed by the customer assistant or the CSA at the station. Um, when a wheelchair is boarded onto the train, the control center is alerted and calls ahead to the station where the wheelchair will need to be deboarded um, so that the attendant can be ready. In some cases, there may not be a CSA present, um, which then the rail car operator will leave the control cab and deploy the gap filler themselves as well. Um, the other use of the gap filler is to assist when the platform edge is not exactly 42 inches from the top of the rail. Although this height is a CTA design standard, many of our stations were built before the CTA adopted the standard. The two-way subway tubes, the red line and blue lines, were built in the 1930s before World War II. Much of the elevated parts of our rail railroad were built in the 1990s, 1890s, sorry, um, at the beginning of the 1900s. Um, as the CTA rebuilt, rebuilds these stations with accessible features, the standard platform height of 42 inches is our design goal. Um, but there are some stations with platform heights not only higher or lower of that standard, but some such as the elevated stations, such as State and Lake. Um, which have sections of the platform at three different heights. This is due to the different dates of the building uh, from building the platform extensions. So a secondary uh, need for effect use of the gap filler is to bridge the different platform heights. So just to recap, um, the 5000 series don't 
perfectly align um, and don't have a sensor as, as the new 7000s will be having that sensor to detect the uh, height level of the platform. Um, and even then, uh, depending on that station, it might not still be perfect, um, depending on uh, the station, if it's uh, far below and it, it needs further adjust adjustments. Are there any questions about anything, whether it's the public comment or our future meetings that I can answer? Irma, I was just wondering if you had the date for the Pride Disability Parade. I know um, it sometimes coincides with the next meeting, and so I just want to know if that date was available so that people have a heads up if they want to participate. Mm. Yeah, it's uh, Saturday, July 22nd. The time is still not quite sure, but it's usually in the mornings. So yeah, I will definitely remind people of in the July meeting uh, once it gets closer. Great, thank you. Just because it's a, it's it's really close to that, but if somebody wanted to mark it down, um, we usually like to have our um, ADA committee if they're interested to participate. Um, we include a mini bus or mini train depending on availability in it, and so it's a great way to to participate and, and show um, and show pride um, in. Uh, in that parade and represent CTA as well as, as members of this committee. Thank you, Irma, for um, the facilitator's report. Um, if there's no more questions or if there's, uh, uh, we don't have any questions at the moment, we can move forward to the next item on our agenda, um, which is old business. Um, does anybody have any old business that they would like to uh, bring to the table and to discuss? Okay, that looks like a no. Um, we can move forward to new business. Um, is there any particular topic or issue that any um, committee members would like to add to the July 10th, 2023 meeting agenda? Okay, it looks like no new business either. Um, before we adjourn, I just wanna take a brief moment and I just want to express my sincere thank you to CTA and to the ADA Advisory Committee and the wonderful Wayfinding Subcommittee. Um, since 2019, like this has been a very informative and just really impactful four years working with the CTA. Um, being able to work with Amy Serpy, the former ADA um, programs manager, and then the former uh, chairs like Angela Davis and Michelle Lee, among so many. Um, it's This has just been um, just a greatly, greatly informative and just, um, it's I'm very sad to leave. Um, so I, I just want to thank everybody at CTA and everybody um, on the committee um, and in the subcommittees uh, just, Thank you so much for making this time um, so impactful. Thank you for all the great brainstorming sessions. Thank you for um, having the space for us to kind of mutually geek out about ADA, as well as talk about our deeper concerns um, about this wonderful legacy transit system, uh, the CTA. Uh, so just many, many thank yous to everybody. Um, and so, yeah, so I am going to uh, move on to the next topic of adjournment. Um, I want to remind everybody on the committee that the next meeting uh, date and time is Monday, July 10th and Tuesday, October 10th. Um, and I also want to remind people that the next meeting um, will um, be hybrid and there'll be a need of a quorum on site from committee members. So please mark both of those uh, on your calendar and make a note. Um, so I'm gonna open up to the committee now. I'm gonna ask for a motion to adjourn. Oops, I, I'm sorry, I'm, I, um, do, we have, uh, do we have someone who wants to motion to adjourn? 
I, I would make the motion, except that I do have one other thing I'd like to say. Yes, please. Two other things. One, uh, this is Michael Kaiser. Uh, Whitney, uh, we appreciate all your work, and I know you've been very diligent. So uh, thank you, and good luck uh, with whatever you're good doing next. Also, I, I'm a little disturbed by the lack of uh, comparative data that the uh, security people have about uh, the uh, level of crime. And I think that, you know, there's so much information in the newspapers about the amount of crime, but there's no real context for it. And to really understand uh, what is going on, the number of crimes, the type of crimes, I mean, I understand that it has to be proportional to the size of the system, but also the number of officers that are dedicated to the CTA versus other systems. So th that's my only comment. Thank you, Mike, for your comment, and um, and and thank you, and thank you for re restating that too. I think that is important to to bring up and make a note about. Thank you. Okay, thank you, and I and I do move to adjourn. <laughs> thank you. And do we have a second for? Um... <laughs> this is Mary. I second the motion. Hey, thank you, Mary. Thank you, Mary. Um, well, with. Uh, Really happy heart. Um, I think we are all in favor. Um, um, the time is 3.32. Um, and thank you all. Thank you for the presenters. And thank you for everyone who took the time today to, to, to talk and show up and ask questions. Thank you all. Thank you, Whitney. Thank you, Whitney. Thank you. Whitney. Thank you.